All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of uh, TCRM Conversations with Iso Bassi. I am Iso Bassi, and uh, today is a special edition because today happens to be June 12th. Now, for those of us who are old enough, who know a little bit about the history of uh, Nigeria and of democracy in Nigeria, we we'll know that June 12th is quite a symbolic day. Um, and it's become Democracy Day in Nigeria. So you're welcome to this edition of uh, TCRM Conversations. Um, now, these conversations are an initiative of the Cross River Movement aimed at engaging, you know, uh, cross riverians and lovers of Cross River State and exchanging ideas that we expect to foster the development of our dear state and country as well. Now, we know that Nigeria has experienced uninterrupted democratic governance since 1999. And of course, with democracy came great expectations for development and better governance, improved social services, more inclusive government. 23 years down the line, we mark Democracy Day today being June 12th. And you know, our discussion today is democracy and the challenges of quality representation in Cross River State. Now, as usual, we have a panel and um, we try deliberately to make a panel comprise of the younger people because we didn't necessarily want um, you know, the uh, veterans to come and lecture us on, on democracy. So we wanted to very much hear the perspectives of you know, younger people within our, our society. So I'm going to introduce our panel and um, this is in no particular order. We have um, Ambo Epeyong, and he's the state chairman of Social Democratic Party in Cross River State. He's um, a passionate leader with a track record as a member of the um, International Society for Civil Rights Movement and the state coordinator of Emerging Political Leaders Forum, you know, amongst other positions that he's held or holds. Secondly, we have Juliet Ama. Uh, Juliet is a multi-award winning impact leader. She's got a BSc in political science. She's a transformational speaker, a gender and leadership development trainer, and an aspiring international development consultant. And she advocates for leadership development of young women and girls through her initiative, Girls Inspiration. So we'll be looking forward to hearing a bit about girl inspiration. It's an organization that advances gender equality and and um, and purposeful living through an inspiring leadership culture and uh, life skills development for global impact. And finally, the last but definitely not the least, we have Tony Ebigwai. Uh, Tony is popularly known as MC the People. He's a broadcast journalist and an on-air presenter with Correct um, 97.3 FM in Calabar. He's the convener of the Emotional Intelligence Conference, which is designed to increase the awareness of emotional intelligence as a skill and tool for building a better society. He's a serving member of Toastmasters International, and the pioneer member of YALI, which is a Young African Leadership Initiative Cross River State, and is also a member of the Rotary Club. So guys, welcome to this conversation. It's nice to have you here. And uh, we look forward to having a highly engaging conversation this afternoon. Um, I think what I'll do before I open it up to the panel is, I will invite, um, if uh, Bobby Udo is on the conversation, I don't know if he is, I can't see him yet, but I felt that it would be important to just sort of share a bit about the history of, um, you know, a bit, a bit about the history of Nigeria that led to the significance of June 12th as Democracy Day in Nigeria. So Bobby, I can see you've joined us. 
So I was just uh, inviting you to share with us, yeah. to share with <laughs> us, um, you know, about the history of Nigeria that has that made June 12th a significant uh, day for us as a country. So over to you. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. I mean, um, I love the topic because June 12th was um, in 1993, I was in University of Calabar then. So um, as a university student, you're expected to be at your most uh, political um, um, part of your life. Uh, so was actively involved in the campaign um, for the eventual winner, um, Shud Abiola. Um, so um, as we know, or if we don't know, Nigeria got our independence, we all know, in 1960, and um, became a republic three years after, in 63. And um, so when we were trying to stabilize, there were a lot of issues within that first republic. Um, several alliances that were in place did not follow the terms of the alliances, and therefore, um, there were issues and infighting in the Western region, region of Nigeria. The military stepped in in 1966. And within that mini, uh, military dispensation, we went into a civil war. And um, so after that war, um, the man who was the head of state, Gowon, promised Nigerians that we will return to a civilian dispensation. We have to remember historically, we've been governed under the colonial dispensation up to 60 when we became under civilian dispensation. Thereafter in 1966, the military dispensation. Gowon took a long time to fulfill that requirement and got kicked out of office in a military coup d'etat by Murtala Mohammed, who survived only six months in government, assassinated. Um, he too had promised a return to a civilian dispensation. Um, what we call democracy, I feel more comfortable calling it a civilian dispensation. Obasanjo, his um, deputy, took over uh, governance and promised a return um, to the civilian dispensation. And we have to correct it. People like to say civilian rule. Rule is what military do. Dispensation is where we elect people into office. So in 1978, we finally started the journey towards the Second Republic. And then Shagari, Shewu Shagari won the election in 1979. Again, there were so many issues, allegations, and fightings um, in that Republic. And it was truncated in 1984 and by the general who is currently the civilian uh, leader right now. So we went into another military dispensation um, and that was of um, Buhari, who now was kicked out of office um, by a general we all know as IPB, Ibrahim Babangida. He too promised, like they all tend to do, promised the return to the civilian dispensation. Um, Babangida, a very intelligent man, uh, nicknamed Maradona, had several ideas for how that should happen. Um, he wasn't just his ideas, he had a council of advisors uh, locally and internationally, and he desired to have politics played according to ideological lines. I know most Nigerians don't understand that we are either socialists at heart or we're Republicans. Um, so he created two political parties, naming one the Social Democratic Party, SDP, and the Republican Arm, which was the National Republican Convention. So the, the promise to return to uh, the civilian dispensation was now uh, on top, top gear. Um, Mushud Abiola won the primaries in Jos um, for the uh, SDP ticket, and Alaji Bashi Tofa from Kanu won the ticket for the NRC ticket. Um, now, one of the interesting thing about the election was the runners up in the SDP primaries um, where um, was um, Abubakar Tiku, who is now the presidential candidate for the PDP. And um, so Abiola had to be confronted with the issue of how do I select a running mate to give me votes in the North? The end of the day, and through bargaining, he went with Babagana Kingibe, who was the second runners-up. 
a Muslim from Borno State. And so we went into a general elections where NLC had Bashitofa, a Muslim from Kanu, and Sylvester Ubo, an Igbo Christian from the South uh, for NLC, but for SDP, a, a Yoruba man from Southwest, Monsieur Dabiola from Ogun State specifically, and with a running mate who is a fellow Muslim, like Monsieur Dabiola from the North. And the voting commenced. It was issued to a large extent issue based, and Abiola being a very intelligent, well connected, wealthy um, businessman, um, built a very strong uh, com campaign and won that election on a Muslim Muslim ticket. Unfortunately, um, several factors. There were several people that thought one camp thought that Abiola, being a close friend of uh, Ibrahim Babangida, was Babangida coming in a civilian. And cloth. Another aspect were military boys who were not comfortable with uh, Mko Abiola, who was not only a very wealthy man now having access to political power. There were also politicians who thought, mm, we don't like the outcome of this election. So we're happy to truncate it. But all these factors uh, came together to en enable Babangida fulfill his wish to delay the handing over of power from the military and to civilians. And that ended in he coming out on the date, June 12, 1992, 1993, to announce um, that the elections um, will not um, um, stand because it was illegal. Because if you remember, or many would not um, be aware, there was a group called the ABN group that went to court to challenge the legality of that elections. It was for legal experts who would have better to see on it. There wasn't any grounds for it, but they found a useful judge, Justice Ikpeme, who is late now, to give a judgment and to declare that election shouldn't hold. But it went ahead and um, that was the basis Barangida used um, to cancel the elections. And we went on the streets protesting um, for several days, um, particularly in the south, and uh, the north had to be a readjustment. And the outcome was Babangida was forced to use his own words, step aside from government and form an interim national government headed by Chief Ernest Shonakon. That government came in in August 1993, and by November 1993, the Chief of Defense Staff, um, General Sani. Um, Abacha took over government and also extended <laughs> and also promised us a return to civilian dispensation. He died five years after without achieving that. His successor, Abubakar, when came into office and swiftly returned us um, to the democratic dispensation in 1993, which has survived up to this point, the longest we've had in history. So that's a summary. Bobby, thank you very, very much. Very eloquently told. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, if you think 1993 to 2022 is uh, it was almost 30 years, and I know that there would be a number of people on this uh, conversation who were probably not born at the time. So I think that that, um, you know, that uh, brief, um, you know, uh, taking us down memory lane, I think would be very, you know, was very helpful. Thanks a lot. Okay, so um, so we've had democratic, um, you know, administrations in Nigeria for 23 years. We see from, you know, what you uh, told us, Bobby, that demo democracy or you know, democratic governance was very highly anticipated, so much so that all the military dictators that uh, ruled always came promising a return to, to democracy. It's been 23 years of democratic governance in Nigeria. I think I will throw this to the panel maybe to get their views and I'll start with uh, MC, the people, maybe I'll start with you. On a scale of one to 10, you know, how would you say that Nigeria's democracy has, has fared in the last 20, uh, 23 years?
Okay, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Again, I'm sorry, I can my video can can come on because of the network here. Please, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Isobasi, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. All right, from your question, my my rating for Nigerian democracy maybe because of my privilege of where I work, I can simply tell you that we are just, we are just joking. Nigerian democracy is a joke. Yes, permit me to use it like that, but I don't even know what to rate. My rating is failure. Well, go, go, on, go, on and, go on and break it down to so tell us why you think that uh, Nigerian democracy is a joke. Okay. So many factors, so many factors. For instance, we say the conventional definition of uh, democracy, the government for the people, by the people of the people. Now, when you look at that part of democracy for the people, I mean the masses now, the, the electorates, the 23 years of Nigerian democracy, how much of this democracy for the people has been felt? The Nigerian populace, the masses. Democracy can only be beautiful when the vast majority today, yesterday we had the National Population uh, Commission director in our office. And I, I just asked him, he said, but roughly by estimate, Nigeria is. 220 million by estimate, though we are preparing for our census. But look at what is happening to the country today. Demo democracy was supposed to be a government, a system of government where virtually, if not 100%, or virtually everything will be, will be available. You find that the conspiracy of this political elite in the, in the, in quotes, democracy. It's just 5% of them who, who just by privilege of either by providence or by anyhow mago mago to just make sure they are there. They are the one truly enjoying the democracy in quotes. Let me just quickly say when our, our guy, sorry, what's his name now that just gave us that uh, narration. Uh, yes, it's Mr. Possible. Udo. Yes. No, it was giving us the background to all these things. One thing is peculiar about everything he was saying. You will see that none of them is truly sincere to help this democracy stand. None of those privileged leaders who have at one time as a military, even as a, a civilian president, was really, really sincere to making this democracy work. It's only in Nigeria you have two religions. It's also in Nigeria you will have two democracies. The May 29th democracy. We hand over to power, power change to civilian in May 29, 1999. It's only in Nigeria you are celebrating democracy day June 12th. Look at that, that, that this whole thing closely. Is this democracy celebration, is it because of the people? My answer to it is no. Absolutely not. It's just because of one personal interest somewhere. And this proclamation came when they were preparing for the second, he was preparing for a second tenor. I mean, this current government, the second bid for second tenor is eight years uh, as a president. He has to do that just to win the heart of the Southwest. I stand to be corrected anyway. Because the main thing, the main thing that that we should be looking at for who killed Kudirat. The Abiola himself, who have they told us what investigation has been carried out if truly we are practicing democracy? Because they say who that goes to equity must come with a clean hand. There are so many things we, we are still here. Thank God, Mr. Sobasi, you, are, you have been there over the years. You have seen Nigeria, you have seen Oyibo, uh, you have seen different things how they run their democracy. Just recently, um, uh, Boris, Boris Johnson 
was vote, vote, vote of no confidence. Thank God he escaped it. Why? Just because he partied during, during a, a COVID-19 lockdown. How dare you? Will you do that in Nigeria? It is in Nigeria. You said no going out, no public. Uh, more people shouldn't be more than 50. But when somebody died, person, because he's a government person, all of them in government, they were all jam parted in one place. The highest thing they told us later is that they are sorry. I can go on and on and on and on because this democracy is not just to come and do road for us. It's not just to give us the light we don't have, the road we don't have. So not when somebody build one bridge, you will begin to shout, democracy is working. So it's not working. By, by according to democracy in this, by 2020, the they rank Nigerian democracy, 109 out of 166. What are their indicators? They look at the electoral process, the judiciary performance, the press freedom, the, 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 the rights, the, the, the civil rights. Not too long ago here, 2020, Nigerians rose, the youth rose and said, we are tired of all these things. Yes, it was tag answers, but underneath is bad governance, this, that, that, that. Ladies and gentlemen, if I continue here today, we will not live here. I am really not happy with Nigerian democracy, truth be told. If you look at my, my, my Facebook, if you go to my Facebook, if I have so many times they have called me to warn me that you don't like the government, I say, you, do, you, uh, you hate Buhari. I say, no, I don't hate Buhari. I hate what they are doing. Nigerian democracy is a scam. Now they have prepared this, a, 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 give him a prepared speech to come and read to us. Don't worry, just read and give them. After all, nothing will happen. I, 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 I permit me to really tell you, I'm not happy with the Nigerian democracy. There's nothing you can say. Okay, if that democracy is so wonderful, do you know that in 2021, 24 states could not attract foreign direct investment, including crossover states? If the democracy is so wonderful, because why? They are not accountable. I asked the Auditor General of Cross River State last year about the, uh, the bailout fund. On air, his answer was, I am not their accountant general. I don't do the calculation, the money work. I said, if you don't do the money, if you don't touch money, don't you do the paperwork? Somebody have to call me and say, why are you asking the Auditor General that kind of question on air? So I don't know how, I am just telling you with all sincerity, Nigerian democracy. Okay, sir, just, I don't know if I still have time. <laughs> we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to you, Tony. Thank you very much. I think you uh -oh. have expressed on the, we can see that they are very strong views. I'm going to bring in um, Ekmenyong Nambo. Um, so I, I, would, I would ask you if you agree with uh, Tony, what do you consider to be the biggest challenge of our democracy? So, I mean, I'm, I'm presuming, you know, if you don't agree with him, you know, please just go ahead and express a, your contrary view. But if you do, what do you consider to be the greatest challenge with our democracy? Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for having me here. Uh, basically, I agree with him to an extent because if you look recently, um, we have been having a lot of advocacy. And the only way we thought as a people that good governance could reign in Nigeria as a whole is through the right end, the right end, so through democracy. But looking at it today, the democracy is only on paper. Welcome to the act. We are not truly running to democracy. Now, it starts from the political party. Of recent, I've been an, uh, um, sorry, I'm a, I'm a chairman of a political party who is trying to change certain roles in within the political party because the true way to know how to pick leaders that can truly satisfy the people is not through delegate system of primary. Let's look at the recent primaries that just went through in all states in the, in, in the nation. You see that many persons were controlled by the, 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 well, I say the, the government of the day that appointed those delegates. 
Now, let's look at the ruling party, the ACC and the CDC. You will see a government, for instance, our state, cross river state, all the delegates who went to Abuja to make that confirmation were those and written by the government of the day. So tell me what order will they take? They only take the order of the government of the day. So it does not show democracy. But the day political parties try direct primary, we are the most popular candidates who have met people one-on-one, -on -one, who people know his antecedents, who people believe in his true nature of leadership, comes, then we see the true aspect of democracy. Because for now, we are just practicing democracy through paper. So there's a lot of wrong that is happening through political parties. Because the only scheme, if you look previously, we made an advocacy in Abuja for independent candidates. And after the oh, when I when I was opportunity to sit down with Professor Sokoye and I asked him why did INEC play play a card to annoy that particular angle? He said, well, they looked at the financial implications of having in the independent candidates. And um, a lot of questions we are looking at do we have such funds to fund them? But I, I told them that these things are things that we could sit down as people to discuss it. It's not for the umpires to sit down and look at their own deficiencies and put down the deficiencies on the need of the people. This is what we need. So there's a lot of issues that has to do with political parties playing a part to demoralize the democracy of Nigeria and the umpires themselves, starting with the, the regulators of electoral acts when it comes to INEC. You, you look into the security angle of it. You talk about the Nigerian police force. There are a lot of things that these people play to demoralize our democracy. So what we have today called democracy that we celebrate is only an angle of um, uh, leadership for the elite who believe that once it suits me, I play. If it doesn't, well, you have to tune it to always fix up. So there's no need for us. To, I, I was, I was before we had this meeting. I was talking to Professor Ochino one of those who advocated for the change of um, democracy day from May 29 to June 12. So we were discussing, fortunately, I brought up an issue, I said, sir, why do you think that June 12 will even be our democracy day? Is it because you are one of those who were in the existence of the SDP political era, where MCO was? He said, no. But if you look at all, uh, before, after the military June card, that the true aspect of democracy started during that era, where people came out to act as in this is who we want. So it's, it's very, very annoying to know that a lot of persons are controlling our country based on their own desires, not looking at the multitude of desires of the people. So we are not in any democracy. We are still autocratic. Uh, um, Sorry, I'm trying to remember the name of somebody who made a statement yesterday on TV about the APC rule. If you look at calling about consensus, consensus, the consensus they are trying to do is to force people to accept who they want. That's no democracy. So we are only playing democracy on paper. So I 100% agree with what he said. But there are, there are some areas where I feel what we do, democracy of today benefits us. We are able to speak out our minds, like what we do today. We could talk to the government, lay our facts down, and disapprove of certain things. That limit at least promotes that, yes, the autocratic anger is not there. It only takes the right people to come together and look at the loopholes in this government and take advantage and talk to the power. So that's just my own angle. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if Juliet is here. I, I know she was earlier, but I'm not sure if she's still. Oh, Juliet, okay, you're here. All right. So, yes, it would be interesting to hear your perspective on um, Nigeria's democracy, how you think uh, we have fed in the last 23 years. Over to you. And then um, just to, sorry, before I hand over to Juliet, just to say, please, if you have any questions or comments, pop them in the chat. 
and I'll be happy to read them out. Alternatively, if you would like to make a contribution to this conversation, you can use the uh, reactions icon, which you would find um, there within Zoom. Um, so you can use that to indicate by you know raising up a hand that you'd like to make a contribution. All right, Juliet, over to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Let me know you're hearing me. Yes, we can hear you. I'm so excited for this opportunity to be here to be having this conversation. It's actually the conversation of the season, and every young person, and well many in Nigeria, should not isolate themselves from conversations like this. Because these are conversations that determines our next line of action going forward. Uh, I'll start by saying uh, no democracy is perfect and no democracy is final, but every democracy can be improved upon. No democracy is perfect and no democracy is final, but every democracy can be improved upon. You know, when uh, Mr. Bobby Udo was giving uh, the history of democracy in Nigeria, he made a statement. He said, uh, many governments, many uh, military regimes have attempted or promised, yeah, that was the word, that was the language, promised to transit Nigeria back to a civilian dispensation. Why is it so? This is because the military regime or the military rule um, was, um, was um, having some inadequacies. There were some errors that came with the military regime. One of which we, one of which is corruption, and another one is um mismanagement of funds, you know, pre vandalism and then um the all, another one was um the abuse of fundamental human rights. That one was more glaring in military administration. But the reason why uh, this persons or this um the military leaders promise to transit us into a democratic era, a democratic dispensation, is so that those shortcomings of the military regime can be attended to, supposedly. So coming to democracy, it is expected that when we move from uh, military rule to democra um, democratic dispensation, civilian dispensation, there should be certain changes one of which is um, um, ensuring that human rights are, are preserved, human rights are prioritized. But do we see that in the government of the day? No. In fact, it's, it's as if, it's as if um, we should wish for a military regime right now, because what, when we look at what happened at the end, SARS, I'm sorry I'm bringing back this, but when we're talking about Koshiba State, it's part of Nigeria. So what happens to Nigeria directly and indirectly affects Koshiba State. So look at the end SARS saga, um, civilians were on the streets and protesting for a better Nigeria through the um, end SARS um, um, umbrella or end SARS um, slogan. What happened? Their rights were trampled upon, whether we agree to it or not. Military was sent to those um, innocent Nigerians. Whereas one of the fundamental features of democracy is our ability to hold our leaders accountable. It is uh, our freedom of expression, and we can do this through demonstration. We can do this through a, a peaceful means, which was the means that those young persons, you know, used. But then what happened? The story is something that we are yet to recover from. Okay, so the, the democracy of Nigeria is not perfect. It's not, um, it's not final. We should not accept it as, um, as the totality of democracy, but we should open our minds to accept and agree that democracy of Nigeria can be improved upon. We can change certain things to suit this dispensation we can change certain things to, to uh, preserve the human rights, to uphold human dignity, such that we can be able to hold our leaders accountable for every office we put them in. By the way, what is democracy? We've been mentioning democracy and you know, we've not been able to really, really explain what democracy is. What is democracy? 
simply is the role of the people to selected or elected representatives. So if I am putting you in a position, you owe it to me to listen to me. You owe it to me to ensure that my life and my property is safe. That is why democracy is democracy in the first place. That I can be able to call you to order when I think you are going, you know, haywire with the power I have given to you. But then, is that the case of today? I think what we are practicing is reverse democracy, whereby the citizens are subjected to the leaders, okay, and not being able to speak for fear of their lives did not be snapped out from, from their hands, you know? Or should I even say we are practicing oligarchy? We are just um, a, a few individuals monopolizes power for their selfish aggrandizement. So if, if we must move forward as a nation, if we must prosper, if we must, talk, if we must have anything close to national development that we clamor for, then I think our democracy needs to be improved upon very important yes Julia, thank you thank you very much i can see that uh, in your view nigeria hasn't fed nigerian democracy hasn't fed very well but there was a point you made about you know under a democratic dispensation people are supposed to protest they're supposed to be able to speak freely and then you drew our attention to what happened during the end sars so i'm going to throw this question at uh, tony a big one now, out of the 23 years of uh, democratic um, governance, we've had 15 of those years, even though it's been democratic, 15 of those years we have been, we've had um, former military dictators as president. To what extent do you think that the, the culture of, of military dictatorship you know, has come into our democracy as a country. Tony. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you again. I am so happy this is happening now. Now, you, like you said, 1999, the former head of state, General Lush, uh, Major General Lushegon Basanjo, became the president, civilian president. And some of us, we, truth be told, Yes, he tried to stabilize some things, but you also see that uh, military tendency in some of his decisions, some of the things he will want to do or, or he did. Fast forward to the current president that we have today. I just gave you some little, little background of how Nigerian democracy is rated. Now, 2015 election, his major cardinal point, campaign cardinal point is to fight corruption, to fight insecurity and revive the economy. And before his emergence as the president of Nigeria, Nigeria economy was already rated as one of the fastest growing economy in Africa. Now, Nigerians believe that Jonathan is not doing well as regards to insecurity. So somehow, for the fact that he's a former military man, Nigerians believe, okay, he can do it. Now, fast forward, talking about democracy, like Julia just said, the will of the people, we are just there to, if all of us can be presidents, it's one person per time. So you are there to champion some of these things. When the issue of SS crude account, he went to the SS crude account to withdraw money without going through the democratic process. The National Assembly must be aware there's a constitutional provision because go and go and check it. Any country does not have respect for their laws. There's nothing, absolutely nothing they can do. Some persons say that Nigeria has been taken aback like eight, 80 years back. It's just, it's just as if Nigerian democracy is just starting. To confirm what I'm saying, in 2018 MBA uh, conference that Nigerian Bar Association, he made a statement, I mean Nigerian president, made a statement that he will prioritize 
national security to rule of law. Every Nigerian, every well meaning Nigerian was not happy with that statement. Now you said, because he's a military president, as a military man, he will, he will be able to fight the insecurity today. Now, part of the problem happening in Nigeria today is injustice. Because you're a military man, you just came in and you declared the IPOB terrorists. What is your reason? IPOB, they are not killing anybody. They are not doing anything to warrant you calling them terrorists. But here we are, the bandits, I've been killing Fulani Hesmen in Benue State in 2019, killed mass, entered and slaughtered and killed many people. And you say you send the IG of police to take care of uh, what's happening in Benue State for three months. You never knew he did not travel to Benue State. <laughs> Only for you to come out in national TV and say, ah, I never knew that the IG of police never traveled to Benue State. <laughs> So, like I said before, let's, so a lot of persons very, they take, they are very, very quick to celebrate. Maybe they give them one, one contract somewhere. There are some little, 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 little things. In his uh, address he gave to National uh, United Nations General Assembly in 2021, he talks, he talked about all these undemocratic processes, injustice, inequality. Has he been, has he been able to, 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 to practice these things? Sincerely, in Nigeria, they, they, they imported adulterated fuel, adulterated fuel to a country that have all these things in abundance. Who has been arrested? In Nigeria, they, they spend about $100 million every year to maintain the Nigerian refine, the Moribon refinery that is not working. Yet, he came to fight corruption. So what are we talking about? I can mention, I can go on and on and on and on and tell you all this thing. That's why I said that if gray hair is a sign of wisdom, very soon goats will become philosophers. We have turned this thing to personal. Once the person is my brother, a lot of things, whether he's doing it right or not, nobody wants to talk. I can still tell you again. Let me bring him down to Cross River State. Juliet Amar was talking about accountability. Government, once anybody is a governor or a president, you dare not ask them questions. You dare not. Before he defected to APC, the current uh, technical advisor to the vice president, Philip Obin, he was on air with me and he said, the governor is arm twisting the local government uh, chairman. He collected about 180 million naira. This what is going on. This one out of many other things that is going on. But go and ask the, the governor now. The, there's a recent one. I don't want to talk about that one. They are writing letters to my office that that boy MC the people. We don't like the way he's talking. Every time he's asking questions, he's doing this, he's doing that. So, sir, that is the problem we are having in our democracy. If now I, I just marry now, make I enjoy my marriage, Abby, I need to keep quiet. And some of these things I know I cannot say it because of the fears of unknown. Nigerian democracy is liking, like the, like the other uh, speaker just spoke, is liking, they call it hybrid uh, regime. Democ our democracy is hybrid regime. Authority, author, that's. If you do anyhow, you see anyhow yeah. in a democracy. It's so unfortunate, sir. Very, very unfortunate. We are not, we have not, we cannot do more than we are doing now. It's not like the people are not trying. Like the youth now, the rate at which people want to get their PVC, I've not seen it for a very long time. The rate they want to get it now, that's to show you how much the people are really tired. Me, I'm, I'm tired of the regime since 2015. A government that is ready should start from day one. A government that is ready should start from day one. Six months after your inauguration, you did not appoint your, your ministers. And the ministers should now finally appoint it. And these are the same set of people who have dragged the country back. Embezzlement here and there. And that's why the team is choking him today. He couldn't do anything. Like they all say, Mr. Integrity.
but I'm still waiting to see that, that display. Thank you very much. Tony, thanks very much. And um, the, the, your passion is uh, very obvious from you know, the tone of your voice. Thanks very much for your contributions. I will, I'm going to read out a couple of uh, comments that have been made before I, and then after that, I would invite uh, Nathan to, um, to speak. Okay, so Kenneth Asimita said, Nigerian democracy, so he's quoting um, Tony, he says, Nigerian democracy is a scam. Strong words, but for lack of a better description, I agree with Tony that the political class have taken the masses for granted. Otu Eno says that we should be thinking of tailoring the democracy to suit our environment instead of importing and imposing from the West. David Essim says, sorry, but if you sell your votes, then you have no right to query those who govern you. And um, Elizabeth Edu says that to a large extent, if we can have a democratic constitution established, I think that's a very important point because mm -hmm. many believe that, many of us believe that the issues with the country are very much uh, to do with the, the constitution, the how the country is put together and the, um, you know, the framework that, uh, that the country operates by. So that's, a, that's an interesting point. So to a large extent, if we can have a democratic constitution established, coupled with good uh, leadership, et cetera, this would go a long way in addressing the menace of democratic institutions. Okay, thanks very much. So there, 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 there are a few polls that we've, uh, we've run and uh, the results are quite interesting. Um, <laughs> and it's nice to know that uh, I think 77% of people on this conversation have their PVC and 8% um, don't have it, but have applied for it, which is a good sign. So that you know, takes us well up into, uh, I think, 92%. So that's absolutely fantastic. 8% um, unfortunately don't have and haven't applied, and it's quite possible that some of those would be outside of the country. And uh, very interesting to note also that uh, if the presidential elections were conducted in this forum here, Peter Obi would be the next president of Nigeria. And then um, <laughs> if the elections were conducted here for the governorship, um, of course, we know that the main um, candidates are Prince, uh, Prince Basio II and uh, Senator Sandiono. No disrespect to any other candidates, but um, according to this, Senator Sandiono would pull double the votes of Prince Basio too. So those are interesting um, you know, polls that we have. David, over to you, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Iso. Um, firstly, MC the people, great to see you here. I love your passion. Uh, but the truth of the matter, I think there are certain energies that are slightly misplaced. When we talk about democracy, I always like to make reference to Socrates' um, opinion of democracy which says that if you want to sail a ship, you, in his time you use the ship, but we can use a plane, we can use anything that requires professional skill. You know, that, sorry, I just was, your, your poll came up, so I just responded. Now, if we use any professional skill, if you want to fly a plane, you do not go to the sweet seller because he's a nice guy and say, come fly the plane and you get on board the plane. You look for someone with competence to do that. Now, since um, the, the advent of this democracy, unfortunately, um, we have not focused on competence. We have focused on the sweet seller. The guy who tells you the nice stuff, the guy who gives you the rice, the vegetable oil, the money for polling, for voting. That is what we have gone with. So in, the, in reality, we have bought the democracy that we have. We created it, we gave birth to it, okay? Now, the beautiful thing about the NSAS situation was that a paradigm shift occurred where the people said, you know what, no more. And now the resurgence, the, the passion for voting today that we see, you know, well, they, some people say it's propelled by Peter Obi coming out as a third force. But the truth of the matter is that people are willing to make the effort for a change. 
So we are finally beginning to get to the place where we, are, we want to own our democracy. Okay, I happen to come from Oran. Now, in 99, the man that represented where I come from, I come from Refon Oruko in Oron, uh, in uh, Refon, well, I come from Oruko in Refon Oruko local government area of Oron in Akwabu State. Now, the guy who represented my constituency in the first uh, state house was the head of the butchers in my village. He was there for four years, did not say one word for four years, goes there, but he collects his uh, allowances and goes home. The guy who represents me today was, a, was more or less a, a gangster in the village, in, the, in Akwaiwa State. Okay, now we have bought the democracy that we have until we, re we, we refuse to buy what a particular political class is selling and choose to buy something different, then we have no right to, 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 to complain. Now, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that even our constitution, a constitution is a living document, okay? When you own your democratic process, then the process through which that democracy comes to life becomes owned by you, and you can then begin to effect changes in the process. In 2015, I voted in Calabar. In 2015, I voted in Calabar. 2019, I voted in, in Calabar. Okay, no, yeah, 2015, I voted in Lagos, but 2019, I voted in Calabar. And in 2019, I was after voting, I voted at the next to, um, to Desam House. I then took a walk around. I saw young people celebrating selling their vote for 4,000 naira. Now, when you divide 4,000 naira by four years, by, um, by th how much is that 4,000 naira? Okay. So these are the realities that we must face. We must, people must cast a vote for a particular person or by collecting money to cast a vote for a particular person. You are actually selling your franchise for that amount of money or that bag of rice. And when you sell your franchise, then you have no right to come back tomorrow to demand service because you have sold it already. That is the reality we need to understand. Okay, now the electorate needs to understand, like Socrates said, for you to have an effective democracy, okay? You, let me just take out my, um, okay, fine, this is better. For you to have an effective democracy, you need to have an educated electorate who understand what it means, the responsibility, that they carry in that voting franchise. What it means, the delegates that went to Abuja, PDP or APC, and collected money for their votes, okay, have sold, they don't even understand the franchise, the responsibility they carry. Because even if I collect $50,000, okay, and I give somebody my vote, how much over a four year period does that $50,000 translate to? If my child dies because of a lack of medication in a hospital, in a general hospital, how much of that 50,000 naira will compensate me for that child that has died? If I die from a car accident because of a bad road, how much of that 50,000 naira translates to compensate my family for my death? These are the realities. These are the issues. Okay. So yeah, I think before we talk about blaming, the governing class, we must first analyze how we have discharged our responsibility of the, 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 the democratic franchise that we all hold by getting a voter's card. Thank you. Let's leave it there for now. But, you know, I'm enjoying the conversation, but I think we need to introspect rather than, you know, point fingers. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Yeah, David, thanks. Thanks very much. Um,
you know, I guess a question that I would ask, and you know, and I guess anyone is free to make a contribution on this. You know, what you said, David, makes sense. I believe that makes sense to absolutely everybody here on this conversation, right? That, you know, if you, you take 4,000 Naira and you, you know, vote for someone who um, isn't the right candidate to, you know, to govern, and you're not asking questions around, you know, maybe service delivery and all of that sort of thing. But the truth about it is that most of our voters are at the level of the wards. And a lot of these wards are in very rural parts of the country where people don't think the way you think, David. Um, so it looks as if for there to be that change, there's got to be a cultural, we've got to change culture and maybe that has to be done through education. And if education has collapsed, you know, then what is the means by which we can change the culture where people don't, um, you know, uh, vote based on what they, they've received, you know, uh, cash inducements, but can think, um, you know, uh, uh, see the long term, see, look at, you know, things like roads, hospitals, etc. Um, okay, so we have uh, two other hands up. Uh, I will invite Aja. I'm not sure what the other name is, but Aja, please, you know, you can unmute yourself and make your contribution. You are still mute. Okay. Good. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Ada Chijuke. Um, from I'm chatting. I'm um, my I'm from Worry at the moment. You know, but I was a Malabite. Um, where I I've been passionate about this uh, this learning, you know, and the system is just that our political class have now made it for you know the system to uh, to favor only them. You can imagine that if they want to pass a particular bill, you know, that will go against all the negative or maybe wrong directions, they will tend to avert such, you know, implementation. Now, the thing is this, I just, okay, just in the just concluded uh, primary, you could see, in fact, I saw a man, a delegate that came back three days, you know, with a new brand car. I was asking questions. You know, they were like, oh, well, this is my share, or my share with this one. So you could imagine the, our thinking. Now, they're not thinking about the, the nearest future, what will become of us, you know, or the generation, but they're just self centered person. So, what I will say in this essence, in this regard, is this our youth. Now, thank God that everybody is not, is not opening. <laughs> but the thing is that if we sit and, you know, not talk, if we sit, because I wish this this garden would have been, you know, I was thinking it would be more than this, but I, I just hope that this message should be passed across to them, that this is not the kind of leadership that we want in Nigeria. Now, we are talking about progression. In fact, today should be, should be a, a, a sort of morning day. They will enter a church and kill a lot of persons. What is the essence of this? And they will not give report. So our, 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 our nation is not accountable, like uh, uh, Ms. Juliet said. But the thing is this. If we as an individual decide to raise men door to door, this is how we want our nation to be. I think we'll make it a better place. So, sir, Amaz, in fact, if our political class can be able to get this information today, I think it will go a long way in helping our society. Because as it stands now, sir, in the, 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 the rate of dollar, <laughs> the, the business we that are, are, are doing business is really affecting us. Just imagine you import something to Nigeria, you will pay equivalent or more of what we import for you to be able to sell. So at the end of the day, there's hike in price and the citizens will be complaining. But yet you will see that there's no option. Even to the end of toothpick, we import toothpick to Nigeria. So if I should continue like this, a person that bribed delegate at the end of the day when they enter office, he will say, ah, I've settled you now. You guys should go. Let me make my money. That's why we are still running into depth up to today. So we need accountability. We need sincerity. And we need open-minded. 
So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much for this uh, program. I think it's very, very impactful. Okay, Aja, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So there's still a few hands uh, raised, but I think I'll go to uh, Kwenyong Ambo. Um, now, we know Nigeria is a very diverse um, country. You know, we've got, what, 250 ethnic groups, if I'm not mistaken. In Cross River State, we've got several different, you know, tribes, etc. So I think the question that I'd like um, you to answer is, you know, to what extent do you think that ethnic and religious sentiments may have hindered our democracy? Okay, so maybe, um, so on a national level, we know that um, there's always that religious sentiment as well, whether it's at the national or the state, there's always, you know, that uh, there's always um, considerations around, you know, tribes and ethnic ethnicity, and sometimes with merit, sometimes with merit, but to what extent do you think this has affected, uh, you know, democracy? Well, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Okay, I think while we're giving him time to sort his audio out, um, Bob Udo, your hand is raised up. Please um, go ahead and make your comment. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that um, I just want to share a few points that would help us. First, uh, governance um, seem to be our focus here. Even though democracy as a system is a, what we chose to deliver good governance, but we have to remember that democracy as a system cannot deliver good governance. It's the people that work the system that enables the good governance to come. Um, so that has to be said first. The second point I want to make is, I think it's important for Nigerians to understand prior to the civilian dispensation, in the military dispensation, somebody from the North was appointed the governor of your state or the military administrator, and it arrives at your state. The people he knew in the army from your state would tell him, choose my brother as commissioner, choose this one as local government chairman. They just make appointments randomly and they fire randomly. None of these people um, were chosen on the process. None of these people consulted you and I before they got into government. But when the civilian dispensation came, whosoever goes into office, even if it's the butcher um, in uh, Ruku that our brother was sharing earlier, he's still going to go and meet other butchers and say, I won't go this thing. He buys drinks for them. He says, when I enter, I go do this, I go do that. Even if he doesn't do it, at least he's consulting. Who is he consulting with? With the people. So I want to just help us understand we are in a democracy. The issue with the democracy is the actors in the democracy, not just the actors who go into office, the actors who participate in the political process. Which leads me to my second point. We carry this mindset, which is a myth, the political class. In a democracy, we're all part of that class. Whether you vote in the general election or you are a party member, and I'm of the view that the party membership should be far and wide. I'm glad we have a party chairman here so he can encourage us to join political parties. You can participate in party activities. We're all part of the political class. It's not just some selected people. Thirdly, I really have to remind us that democracy is an entitlement is key to democracy. Because as in a, is a monetized society, money is the key instrument to use for enticement. Believe you me, if you go and do all that stuff for people, they will look at you, money that will talk. Because outside of politics, other areas, money talks. So enticement is key. I know I live in, in Lagos, and in our area in Lagos, they use development to kind of get us to see what they're doing so that they win elections. In the West, Having lived in the UK, I've seen how they use um, certain developments and um, certain incentives for an area to win votes from them. I've seen how with America's development, citing of industries, citing of um, certain projects is used to win votes or swing votes in certain areas. So enticement, we need to understand these things. This is how it works. So we need to think that, okay, why is money the critical enticement key for democracy in Nigeria. 
instead of projects that will benefit us? Because when we ask those questions, then we're able to answer. Many of us talk about the same, but these delegates that voted in the primaries and for gubernatorial for that were chosen from the communities. They were they paid money to stand for elections. When they won the elections, they had to make returns because this is the work that they're doing. They're not putting money to do charity. So let's be clear about this thing. We don't agree with it, but this is how it works. Understanding how it works enables us to understand how we can make it better. My final point, just to give other people a chance to speak. We need to understand something about democracy. It takes a long time for you to shift from a military dispensation to a civilian dispensation. By that, I mean, we moved from military into democracy in 1999. But most of the actors, the people in office, the people in the party, the people who vote, were people who were born, bred, brought up in a military dispensation. And we practice that military mindset in our homes, in our schools, in our com How many parents who are in their 40s and 50s will have children that will ask them, Daddy, what is this thing on television? My friend, shut up, you're making noise. That's a military rule at, at work there. We run our schools. You ask a teacher a question, you disagree with the teacher at school, you're, you're in trouble. You, you're stopped on the road by the police. Where's your license? You show and you ask them, why are you stopping me? That's an offense. So we see the military mindset in various facets of our society. And yet we wonder why the democracy will be different because the actors will bring that mindset into the system. The system is not the issue. It's not democracy that is the issue. It's the mindset brought into it. But thankfully, the millennials, the Generation Z are coming in with a different mindset. And I believe that if we are patient enough to continue to gradually process the system, we will see a different mindset with different actors mm -hmm. and we see better results. We need patience. We need to be consistent. The people who are pushing Peter Obi, if he doesn't win in 2023, keep the moment, movement going so that the result may be in 2027 or even 2031. Patience is needed. Thank you. All right, Bobby, thank you very much. Thanks very much. If I may just, if I may just quickly say something. Yeah. The reason why the man in 99 went in, the butcher from Uruko went in, was because people like me and others felt that the democratic process was a hoax. We did not participate in it. We left it, and nature opposed a vacuum. And that is how that happened. Now, just to align with what um, Udo said, that we've got to own the process. That's all I just wanted to interject there. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. So there are a couple of, um, there's a bit of humor going on in the chat. So Otu says that on a lighter note, in fantasy <laughs> land, military coup, delegates should be tried alongside yeah, the officers. Can I assume it? The delegate should be tried for treason. And it uh, goes on to say that the apathy on the part of the populace in participating in the political process is actually our Achilles heel. The larger population, especially the elite and educated demographic, demographic consider the process dirty and are not ready to actively participate in it. Okay, um, that's very interesting, and, and, and you know, and, but but I do feel that things are changing, and you know, maybe the maybe you know, candidates, for instance, we conducted a poll here, and you know, overwhelmingly everyone said they would vote for. Um, Peter will be, and since he clinched the, um, uh, you know, the ticket under the Labour Party, we've seen the number of uh, people turning out to register for PVCs. You know, that has increased exponentially. Uh, so yeah, maybe that's something. It would be good to hear, Bobby. I mean, what's your view on, you know, a candidate like that coming out and the impact that that could have on, on, um, you know, on our democracy. Because people are saying, you know, we know they share anything. We know they share anything, you know, and, and people have volunteered and really taken on his campaign. You know, what 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 do you think his prospects are, and what impact do you feel his um, candidacy would have on our democracy, whether he wins or not? 
Yeah, I think that um, we have to remember these things are not new. Um, Aminu Kanu brought out a party in um, 1978, the great Nigerian People's Party. Um, this was a guy who was socialist. Was, was, was he right? 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 Thank you. Thank you. Was he right? Thank you. Aminu Kanu was an older guy. Was he right? From Borneo brought out this party and tried to mobilize. There were a few people, oh, we kind of like what he's doing, but they didn't put their heads out. I remember closer towards this 2011 when Ribadu came up for ACN and uh, Fola Adeola was his running mate. We in Lagos, or I was in the UK then, but joined the movement and we mobilized and we made a lot of noise. This is the new third force as we tend to call it. <laughs> Force. These are new ideas. This is a the guys that we need, and we made a lot of noise. However, they didn't win the votes because elections is more than just having the right candidate. There's several other things that happens in order for you to win. The control of the military, the control of the boxes, all of those comes into play. But like I said earlier, we're making progress every day. Peter B has come out now. The first sign we're observing is a lot of people who had not bothered to register for a PVC, in their tens of thousands are registering to get involved in getting a PVC and vote for the election. That's the first plus. The second plus is that many Nigerians who were just happy to wait for the election day in February 2023 and go out and vote are not doing that anymore. They're thinking there's something I can do between now and then. So many are giving funds, giving resources, joining groups, having meetings, strategizing as to how we can go out into the streets, educate the masses, get them to get their PVC and help them understand when they bring the money, collect it. But this is what you're going to do because this is what your destiny um, depends upon. That's progress number two. Third one is that when we begin to see that the major parties will they have this the data they observe the trend that Peter B is gaining a lot of traction and I won't be surprised if it goes up to certain parts in the north that you will see the major political parties begin to align their strategy so that they will take a bit of what he's doing in order to steal some of his voters. So if he's going a lot on issues, you will see a lot of the the Tinibu and Atiku people begin to emphasize issues, address issues. So we will see the third point, the campaigning will become more issue-based than ethnic, religion, and other uh, issues. So those are the benefits. We did stand a chance, in my personal view, um, speaking from my head, not from my heart, I don't think so. But what I would desire is that after February 2023, that the same people will keep the movement going so that we can continue. This is the problem with our democracy. We wait four years, then we wake up. But there's a lot, if you study democracy in the West, I was part of the uh, conservative club in Thorok in the UK. There's so much work that goes in daily, every week, every month, so that when the general election comes, the fruit is what you harvest them. But so much is done prior to that time. Let us go into 2023 and think beyond the elections. After the elections, we continue to, to campaign. We continue to mobilize. We continue to educate the masses so that when the government in office is doing something, we tell them, you see this thing where they do, this is what it means. This is why we must vote them out. So that by the time the next election comes, people have moved from PVC to party membership, to becoming delegates, to choosing the right actors, and then we will see the end result. And then there'll be alliances between North and South, South and West, West and East, because all those elements need to come together in order for us to deliver what we're looking for. All right, thanks very much, Bobby. Okay, I'm gonna go over to Juliet, uh, who's part of our, our panel. Um, Juliet, you know, your organization, I believe, advocates for, um, you know, gender equity. Um, now, we know that, you know, th th there's, there's never been a female, um, you know, the governor elected in Kosovo, uh, sorry, in Nigeria in the last 23 years. 
do you want to speak about, you know, what are your views with regard to the representation of women in, in, in politics and how, you know, women may get more involved in politics? And um, indeed, you know, if you look at, if you look at the at government over the last 23 years, there have been women in government who've been very high performers, you know, but why haven't we ever had a female governor? That's one, you know, and why is the politics really, really over dominated by men? And what can be done to bring more women into um, uh, politics and, you know, and democracy as a whole? Juliet. Okay, it feels good to be back again. Well, women participating in politics uh, is something that is still coming up. We have women who are in politics, women who are interested in leadership, but we don't have women who are in top leadership positions, like what you, the one you just mentioned, the presidency and the leading the band. There has been no woman there. Uh, the, the question you asked is, why are there no women there? Well, uh, it, it saddens my heart to say that Nigeria as a country, we still you know, practice, or should I say, operate uh, uh, under the patriarchal system. Uh, the, the, the patriarchy in Nigeria is so strong and so, so long, and for it to be broken, I think women need to um, stand up for themselves. You know, nobody gives you power. Nobody says, come and take. So you, you, you seek for it, you go for it, you fight for it. It is not given, it is gotten. So it is not just for women to sit down at home and say, we are not giving chance to grow. There is no opportunity. Create the opportunity for yourself. And that is why uh, my organization, The Inspiration, we, we are a campus-based organization. And our major role is to help young girls, female, uh, female students, to first of all discover themselves because you cannot lead yourself, you cannot lead a nation, you cannot lead an organization if you do not understand who you are, if you don't find yourself, if all you do is TikTok and all you do is WhatsApp and all you know about life is Instagram, then you will not be given the chance that you think you deserve. It begins with self-development. Women need to develop themselves to show intelligence, to show capacity. My voice is low. I'm so sorry, my voice is low. Can you hear me now? Hello. Please, if you can hear me, let me know so I don't. We can hear you. We can hear you perfectly. Okay, okay, thank you. So, women need to develop capacity to rule. Look at what happened during the uh, primaries, the uh, FEC primaries. There was, there was um, a woman. Um, a female aspirant, look at what she said. She just came on board and she breaking the bias in the mall. I wrote about that on my Facebook because I was so, so disappointed. When we talk about women being in government, women being in top leadership positions, we have to be represented well. It's not just because we are women, but because we have the ability, we have what it takes to be in that position. She coming to the primary and saying something that demeans the ability of women and reduces our chances to lead is one of the problems we have in women and participating in, in politics or being involved in leadership. She said that um, uh, it is not yet time. It is not yet time. So by saying it is not yet time, what are you trying to say? That is it that we are not yet capable or we don't have what it takes to lead? The answer is no. We have not, we ourselves have not begun to grow to the point where we can be given that chance. We need to grow, we need to improve, we need to show ourselves worthy, we need to show ourselves accountable and responsible. And that is the job that we do in the inspiration, helping these young ladies understand that leadership is a fight. And for you to ascend certain positions, you must fight to get there by developing yourself. And by, by developing yourself and by standing up to, you know, being involved. How many women have uh, the activities? How many women go to um, the, uh, the voting polling units? We have more of men. So people who show up are people who are given opportunities. To. We have less women who show up. Okay. If today we want to have a female president in this country, 
if all the women in Nigeria decides to vote for this one candidate who is a female, a female we have a chance. So I don't, aside from the fact that patriarchy exists, I mean, there are some men who will always resist um, the leadership of women due to mindset and other things. But women need to stand up and decide that they want to lead and see who stops them. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very uh, passionately um, um, spoken. Okay, let me go. Oh, we'll start winding down. We'll start winding down. And maybe this may be, you know, the final remarks from uh, Epenyon. But I want to address this question um, to you being a party chairman. Now, we've seen the role that money plays in our politics. And I think you even touched on that earlier. Uh, we saw that the primaries, you know, of the main parties, really, the tickets really went to, you know, almost in every case, the highest um, spenders. What can we do, um, you know, what can we do to remove that dependence, you know, that um, uh, overwhelming influence of money? We know money, of course, is important in politics, but how can we remove that dominance, that dominant role that money plays in, 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 in our in our politics, especially when it comes to um, uh, electing delegates, because at the end of the day, it's who the parties put out that the people eventually vote for. So the parties need to get it right. What do you think we can do? Do we scrap the delegate system or you know, what, what can we do? Sorry, we can't, we can't hear you. Uh, it looks like do you want to switch your video off? Maybe you can switch your video off and then let's see if we can hear your audio. Nope, we still can't hear you. Nope, okay. Let me go to- Maybe, maybe you should take off this earpiece if it's wearing one. Okay, okay. Well, you can keep trying and you know, if you're able to, if we're able to hear you, we'll come back to you, but- uh, you know, Tony, let's 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 uh, throw this question at you, and maybe this may be the final question. So you may also include any uh, closing remarks that you have. So, you know, it's it's it, you know, most of us we had different people that we thought uh, maybe would be the best candidate um, for the APC and the best candidate for the PDP. Um, I'm talking about the presidential uh, primaries, for instance, and if you recall. Um, you know, when the vice president was invited to the podium for about five minutes, he couldn't speak because everyone, they kept hailing him and hailing him and hailing him. And then when it came down to the results, <laughs> they were completely different from, um, you know, from the voice votes that we, that we had there. So why is it, why in your opinion, you know, what is it that we can do to change this? Why is it that we, you know, the parties keep, you know, tend to produce the people who generally are not perceived to be the best candidates. At the end of the day, it's who the parties give us that we vote for. That whole process of giving us the candidates, you know, Hello. what, in your opinion, um, makes it deliver candidates that uh, are usually not the best candidates in the views of the public majority. Tony. The people, okay, yes, uh, yes. Um, the can you hear the me answer. Now? Yes, Ekpenyo, we can hear Hello. you. So once Tony is done, we'll come back to you. Okay. Tony, carry okay. On. The answer is simple. First, you ask about delegate. If we should scrap delegate, can I? If I don't know if you follow the the uh, the events. When first National Assembly said direct uh, direct primaries, you see how you see how Nigeria celebrated that part of the Electoral Amendment Act. Uh, before the political elites gather themselves again, because they know if they go by this, many of them will not will not get these tickets. So if you ask me if it's possible, we should stop this delegate thing because you see some of them they will go so as be. It's a, it's a party for them, it's time for them to share, follow, share their own national cake. Like that, my brother went to talk from Warisho. 
the delegate, somebody come back, he don't buy car. The other man for Cardona say carry money go uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, foundation, one foundation to share money, 12 million naira in just within two, three days. So the problem is not just the people in the rural area. So the pover, the pover, the rate of poverty sir, is very, very, very high. So then, me, I think we should be intentional now. I like everybody is talking this and we should be intentional first. We should check the people's per degree. People's per degree. How this person takes that? Okay, you say you've been in the you've been a, 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 a what's it called? You've been in politics. You've been in government. Check their per degree. What have they been doing? Many of us know these people very well. We should check it. Somebody is saying now we'll continue from where Buhari st uh, uh, will stop. What is the pedigree of President Muhammadu Buhari? The greatest corruption anywhere is nepotism. Is it what you want to do? When you come again, you begin to put whether the person has, uh, uh, or Bobby, I think Bobby said that, competence. The people that occupy these various positions. How can you tell me students are on holiday and you are doing school feeding program? And you have spent five more than 500 million naira to do school feeding when they are on holiday. Who does that, sir? So these are the things we need to be intentional. We need to be intentional. I think that's not the only thing I need to say. And I like the passion. Everybody wants to see what will happen next. We need to be intentional and check the pedigree of these people who say they want to be president, they want to be governor, they want to be have okay, constituency project that all this way, if they are truly doing it. Why is it that our rural areas, no light, no road, no pipe on water, no do nothing, go and look some places in Cross Rivers. I'm not from Cross Rivers, but I bet you what I do. You go to some villages, their school build, their schools, the building have collapsed. Children under the tree, I mean in Cross Rivers, not in the north, in Cross Rivers State. So we need to look at who are the people representing. We are talking about so quality representation. Who are the people representing this? these constituencies. And there are so many of them today coming up and in this part of the world, now what I now notice that is capacity here is who has the money. You see everybody shouting, God, my leader, capacity, my leader, capacity, because it will touch the money. So there is high rate of poverty. As I'm talking to you now, a, a, another, another report is coming out that more Nigerians are going to enter, drift into poverty, extreme poverty, including those ones staying in urban cities. So we need to look at these people coming next as our president and governors, and not just because of, we have mentioned it earlier too, this inducement, Gary, uh, uh, Rapa, this, that, that. They already know this is our weak point. I wish, if, if you ask me, I don't even want us to collect. We shouldn't collect. I, I, I advise people to collect, you are, you are as guilty as charged. Sir. You collect it, God come today, you are a Christian, you, you will not be free from the charge. So me, I will not advise to collect. We are not, I will not advise to collect. Thank you very much. Tony, thanks, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much. I will jump onto the comments. Okay, this one is from uh, Anne Safasi. I think she disagrees with you. She says, collect the money if they offer, if they give or offer you, but still vote right. And then uh, Bobby Odo says, it is interesting that in in uh, political parties, we have women leader and youth leader. We don't have men leader. That's a very interesting point. <laughs> I think, I think uh, you know, but when we get to the point where we don't have um, um, you know, women leader and youth leader, then I think at that point, we could say that we really might have arrived at the sort of, uh, you know, in, in, in inclusivity that uh, we should have in our politics. Okay. Um, yeah, there's another comment there. That's a long one. Uh, I'm not going to read it out. But Bobby, I would like to hear your view because you, we focused a lot on the, you know, sort of elections. I would also like to hear from you, especially because of what, you know, you specialize in, you know, in nation building about how citizens at all levels can get involved in improving our democracy. You know, how do we uh, touch on, I guess, things that we can do ahead of the election? But after the officials have been elected, what is it that we can do to improve 
uh, democracy. I think, Bobby, if you can just, you know, just summarize it, please, in uh, maybe a minute or two maximum. And then, Ekpenyong, oh, oh, sorry, Bobby, just hold that. Ekpenyong, let's have your closing remarks. If you're Thank audience. you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, basically, I want to really emphasize on the issue of um, the first phases of democracy, which has to do with party politics. Um, most of us, I, I, I will say that I've been an activist for about 16 years before I ventured into party politics and I became a DG and I saw a reason why not to be a DG anymore and now handle a party seat. And uh, in this position, I've seen a lot. I've learned a lot. I've also underst understand that it is easy to sit on the table and talk and uh, discuss, brainstorm, then bring out great ideas. One another thing is now to put those ideas into action. Uh, if you look critically at Nigeria as a whole, I want to specifically look at Cross River State. Bivra change communication has been one of the poorest things that we have done in our state. We our communication style towards behaviors, to activities that has to do with politics, um, social gathering, um, uh, will I say, devices that happens around the state has been very poor. Why? Because everybody waits for who owns that money, who have that money to push. I could remember, I still say that I could remember when I, when I led the protest against Ayade logo in Cross River State, where tear gassed were arrested, like myself, I was arrested twice and released, I still continued. So when I saw it that the only best way we could do this thing, to change this thing is get involved in, in, in party politics. And we don't need the regular political parties because in the regular political parties, the big vipers will always quench your mouth with their people. They have in the, in the regular political parties, if you look critically, the young people both women and um, both young men and women are energized through monetary things by the um, vipers. So whatsoever they detect is what they play. So if we as young people who are organized, who feel we could change the system, want to really change the system, we, we, I don't think it is, it is nice or advisable for us to venture into the regular political parties. Let me give for instance, the, um, um, the pre-primary eras, we all know the actors of the, um, the major political parties. These were already actors that have been in, in existence over time. They have held one political office or one or um, another over time. What were their scorecards? But nobody asked those questions. People were looking at, okay, what can they bring to the table immediately? That's how much do they have to buy us? And that was what was going on. That was why people like um, our, our leader from the South, Senator Gershon, was saying that I'll measure dollar for dollar, pounds for pounds. But if we really want to change a system, we should look at the credibility of a political party, small political party, get there, try to retune the political party to what we as a movement want. Then when we get that, we appoint people to all positions in those political parties to represent what we need. Then we create a movement through the political party to sell candidates that we think can represent us at every level. Because it is not enough for us to sit down, say the ideas, talk about democracy without looking at party politics. While we have failed, example now, we have Sandy Ono, we have Prince Otu, we might be having candidate which you hear from other political parties like my party and the rest. But is this, are these candidates the true candidates that this movement wants? But these are the candidates that the party choose to present to us. So we are forced to pick candidates, the best candidates among these ones, even when they are not the best. So now the only thing I would advise us to do is everybody should start writing things how to get into political parties, how to rewrite political party processes, how to get involved in these political party processes and, and bring in the results. Behavioral change communication is very, very vital through these arms. 
that's my final words for today. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks a lot. We appreciate that. Uh, Bobby, if you can just use a minute, maximum two minutes, and just tell us what can citizens do and what should citizens be doing um, post elections to strengthen our democracy going forward? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think the, the thing we have to understand is most people don't understand what democracy is. And um, one of the things we have to understand is that many nations have grown from those who traveled to where democracy has seen her best practices, not perfect practices. So you look at Le Kuan Yew, who studied in the UK and understood how democracy worked there, came to initiate some um, reforms in his own country, and today we see the result. Um, there have been several other examples. So I think that those who have seen best practices or have gone abroad to study best practices should undertake um, a strategic way of public education and public informative education. Because let me give an example. Um, when I go out to speak, I ask people who is responsible for the primary uh, education in your state. Is it the federal, state, or local government? Most people will say it's Buhari's responsibility. We don't understand that the primary education is the responsibility of the local government. And that local government has a councillor for education if the state governor has conducted local government elections. So we need to understand that every state must conduct a local government election. Some state governors go four years without even conducting one election. So education, um, political informative education is so vital because it's what you know that empowers you. That's one. Two, we need people to understand that when a government is elected into office, we need to study what they're doing. And one of the ways you study what the government is going to do in the next one year is to look at what they're proposing in their budget. The budget, budget is not just a financial um, proposal, it's also um, a manifesto or a cost of predicted action or projected action for the year. So we study that, we download it, we form groups, and we mobilize people to educate them. This is what they want to do. Uh, yeah, this is one trillion. Where is one trillion coming from? Because this is what we earn, this is what we're owing. Where is it going to get the money? And a workers earn this amount, how do we go about it? So people can then ask the questions. Thirdly, we need to understand that your local government councillor, your house of assembly member, your house of rep member, your senator holds regular, will be surprised to They hold regular, people call it surgery as it's called over here, but they hold regular meetings. People don't attend. It's when election comes that we attend. Attend those meetings. When they see more people, the senator comes in for Christmas. He sits down, you attend the meeting. This is what we're doing. We put this ball hole. You say, oh, girl, that water is not flowing. Okay, this healthcare uh, center, we need this here. Can you bring mosquito nets? Can you look at the needs of the community, present it to him? But unfortunately, when he comes, we line up and say, oh, girl, oh school fees have not been paid. Oh, oh, this one, and he shares the money. That's what tends to happen. We don't present the needs of our community to our representatives who will go canvas and bring it down. We don't tell our, our reps that, okay, police is doing recruitment. We have people in the area who want to join the police. They don't have money to pay those bribes. Can you take one person who has an interest to join the police to join the police and all other opportunities that are available and um, then? And then lastly, we need to understand the hard work that is involved in a working the democratic system so it can give us the delivered result. So join meetings, attend the meetings, take out whatever the actions are, do what they tell you to do so that we're gradually making pro progress. And let's be patient because patient is required to get the desired result. It may take eight to 16 years for us to see this democracy deliver for us what we really want. Thank you. Bobby, thank you very, very much. Um, our time is fast spent, so sadly, we have to bring the conversation to a close. Um, thank you very much to our panelists, um, MC The People, Mr. Tony Abigwai, 
Nekweyong Ambo, thank you very much. Juliet Ama, thanks for making our time to be with us and to contribute to our conversation this afternoon. We really do appreciate you and to everyone who took our time this evening to be part of this conversation. Thank you very, very much. Other comments were made, but you know, I guess you know, people on the conversation may have had the opportunity to read the comments. I can't read all out, but you know, we appreciate your feedback. Um, our next conversation takes place on the 26th of June, 2022. And um, I, I have a special request to make. So I, you know, I, I'm gonna post a link in the chat to our YouTube channel. And um, please, I'm asking everyone on the call, if you haven't already um, subscribed to our channel, click on that link, subscribe to the channel, and there will be a bell icon there. So if you click on that and you, I think, select all, then you will be notified whenever we publish our videos, which is, which is quite often. We have videos, at least maybe two, three videos going out every fortnight. So please, um, click on that and uh, subscribe and share that link as well. You can follow us on Facebook at uh, Cross River Move and then uh, also on Twitter at Cross River uh, Move. And our website is in the process of being um, uh, transitioned by tomorrow. Actually, our website should we will migrating from one platform to another. We should have that up by tomorrow, the address of the site is www.crossrivermove.com. Visit it tomorrow, and if you haven't signed up already, please go ahead and sign up. Thanks very much. What I would do, I'm gonna play, while I give people time to click on the YouTube link and subscribe to the channel, allow me to just play a video for us, just so that we end the conversation on a, on a live. I want to go yourself. Say your vote, just say your future with us, say your best right. How much self can uh, divide them by four years? How much with that? Ah. No, sell your vote. Oh. No matter the thing them they tell you, no matter the thing they do you, no matter how much money them they give you. No sell your photo, no need to fight, oh, because they're picking no go join you. They go, they won't come and they love you. Oh, no sell your photo. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. If you look at the situation, hey. everything harsh for this our nation. Hey. Poverty rising and inflation. Hey. Line still day for the fuel station. Hey. This gotta change my determination. Hey. This election, no intimidation. Yes. Protect your selection, we gotta make sure. Yes. Everybody votes count for the future. For yes. the future. Shall you yeah. hide well, 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 No let anybody deceive you. Don't no let them take your vote from you. Shall your future be that Yakare, Yakare, Dukuanitane, Dunkusin Shari, 
to everyone who has been part of the conversation today. Thank you, Bobby Udo, David Aiton, for your contributions as well. I wish you all uh, a wonderful what's left of your weekend. <laughs>